You're in the ER, and it's crazy busy as usual. EMS rolls in with a 55-year-old male patient who missed his last two dialysis sessions. His family called 911 because his blood pressure has been rising, and he's been feeling more tired than usual. Now, you're the primary nurse. What are you immediately prioritizing? What are your immediate actions? Why is getting an ECG so important? How does missing dialysis become deadly? And again, what are the interventions that you are going to prioritize as the primary nurse? So to help you prepare for patients like this, this video will walk you through everything you need to know to confidently manage hyperkalemia in the ER. We're also going to touch on other critical complications of missed dialysis like fluid overload, uremia, and severe hypertension. You'll learn how to recognize key ECG changes, know which treatments to give, and in what order, and we're going to finish with a real-world scenario to strengthen your critical judgment and help you stay efficient and safe under pressure. As always, thank you for watching. So let's start with the basics. What is hyperkalemia? Hyperkalemia is a condition where there's too much potassium in the blood. Normally, potassium levels should be between 3.5 to 5. Once it hits above 5.5, we can start calling that hyperkalemia. However, in the ER, when we see it go above 6, 6 and higher, we start treating it like a big deal and making it a priority. Why? Because potassium plays a crucial role in how the heart beats. When it's too high, it disrupts cardiac conduction, it irritates the heart, and this irritation can lead to deadly arrhythmias and even cardiac arrest. The most common cause we see in the ER is renal failure, especially in dialysis patients who miss sessions. Their kidneys just don't work and can't clear the potassium. Potassium. But it can also happen when potassium leaks out of cells, like in burns, crush injuries, and rhabdomyolysis. Other culprits can include certain medications like ACE inhibitors, and conditions like DKA, where insulin deficiency or acidosis causes potassium to shift into the bloodstream. With a DKA, do be mindful that even though the acidosis causes the potassium to shift into the blood, generally, the patients in DKA have a lower potassium whole body level. So just be careful when you're starting insulin for those patients. Now, as an ER nurse, spotting hyperkalemia early and suspecting it and being proactive with the treatment, especially in these renal patients who miss our dialysis, is key to prevent from things just going downhill fast. Now, let's talk about the symptoms and why hyperkalemia is deadly in more detail. First, patients may come in feeling weak, fatigued, or have numbness and tingling. These are the subtle signs, but when you hear them, especially in someone with kidney issues and they miss dialysis, start thinking their potassium is high. We have to check it out and treat it accordingly. Of course, Emergency 101 states that any patient coming in for numbness and tingling requires a rapid exam to look for stroke-like symptoms. So don't forget that if your patients ever present with those symptoms, you should be doing a quick NOR exam to make sure it's not something emergent that needs to be treated right now, like a stroke. With hyperkalemia, like we discussed, the big issue with it is the heart. Hyperkalemia messes with the cardiac conduction and irritates the heart, and that's where the danger lies. You might see top peaked T waves, a widened QRS, or even a sine wave pattern. And that sine wave, if you ever see that on an EKG, is going to be a pre arrest rhythm for these patients who are super hyperkalemic. But again, the primary things are going to be top peak T waves and a widening QRS. That's why the very first thing you should do in any renal patient with concerning symptoms is to get an ECG before even labs come back, right? Because the labs can take a while to come back. But if your patient missed dialysis a couple of times, you can get an EKG really fast and you can already start seeing if there's changes to the heart, if there's any type of arrhythmia, if there's any top peak T waves or a widening QRS and start giving the treatments prior to even getting the lab results back. Also keep in mind, patients with missed dialysis are often in trouble for other reasons as well. They may have pulmonary edema from fluid overload, uremia from toxin buildup, acidosis, and even severe hypertension. So don't get tunnel vision with these patients with missed dialysis. But again, hyperkalemia is going to be a primary focus, but these patients often have multiple other complications that you need to keep in mind. Here, I wanted to provide an example with peak T waves so that the next time you're performing an ECG for a patient with hyperkalemia, you are better able to recognize it. In the top rhythm, you can see how the QRS is widening and how it eventually will look like a sine wave. 
then the, pre the patient will progress into cardiac arrest with ventricular fibrillation or any other deadly rhythm. Your job, again, is to be able to recognize peak T waves and a widening QRS on these patients where you suspect hyperkalemia, as well as heart blocks. Since remember, if the heart is getting irritated, anything out of the ordinary, such as a heart block, is important to know so that treatment can promptly begin, even prior to obtaining the potassium result. Now, let's dive into the treatments for hyperkalemia. There are going to be two main goals with treatment. Stabilize the heart and either shift potassium into the cell or get it out of the body. We start with calcium gluconate because it stabilizes the heart. It stabilizes the cardiac membrane. It doesn't lower the potassium, but it buys you time by stabilizing the heart and making it less irritable. Calcium decreases cardiac excitability, preventing fatal arrhythmias. Typically, you're going to give 1 to 3 grams of calcium gluconate over 10 minutes. Again, you give the calcium first. The docs are going to place in all the orders, and it's going to be up to you to know how to go about it so that you know which one to give first. And again, you give the calcium because it's going to buy you time as it's going in to get the other medications ready. Next up is going to be the insulin with the dextrose. Insulin ships potassium back into cells. The usual dose is 10 units of regular insulin IV with an amp of dextrose. The key point here is to check a point of care glucose prior to the insulin to ensure the glucose level is not low. If it is low, you must notify the provider so they can switch to 5 units instead of the 10. You should also repeat the glucose check to ensure it did not drop the level. Yes, again, you are going to be giving the app, but you also want to be cautious and recheck the glucose just to be sure. I've had times when the glucose is very low and we start we start them on a D5 infusion prior to giving the insulin just to make sure that the patient is not going to go hypoglycemic and us create another problem for this patient. So always prior to giving the insulin with the dextrose, Check the glucose if it's slow, communicate with the team so they can perhaps lower the, the dose and or as well give more uh, dextrose to just make sure that we're not uh, dropping their sugar. Now, sodium bicarbonate is also going to be given because acidosis pushes potassium out of cells. Bicarb reverses that effect, pushing the potassium back into cells, decreasing the levels in the blood. Of course, the only definitive treatment for patients with ESRD on dialysis um, is going to be getting dialysis, but it takes time to arrange. So while you're waiting, you're using these medications to stabilize the heart and shift potassium back into cells in the meantime. There's also medications like, like Lasix, which help excrete potassium if the patient urinates, but some of these dialysis patients just don't make any urine anymore. So it's not going to do anything. And albuterol can, sh can help shift potassium into cells. But it increases the heart, rate, the heart rate, which can be very risky in someone already unstable and very tachycardic, since it's going to further drive the heart rate up. And finally, we have Cayexalate and Lokelma, which bind potassium in the gut. They're useful for mild hyperkalemia, but way too slow in emergencies because they can take up to six to eight hours to even start working. They're not going to help in the brief next hour when you need it. So you prioritize the other medications like the calcium, the insulin, the dextrose, and the bicarb and getting dialysis set up. Now, let's move into a scenario. You have a 55-year-old male who missed his last two sessions of dialysis. Again, family called 911 because his blood pressure has been going up and he's been feeling more tired than normal. EMS states history includes kidney failure on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, diabetes, and hypertension. He takes his medications inconsistently. So what are going to be your priorities for this patient on arrival? If you need to pause, please pause it so you can think of your priorities for this patient on arrival. The ABCs and getting him on the monitor for a full set of vital signs is going to be one of the most important things. How is his work of breathing? his respiratory rate, and SpO2. Remember that patients who miss their dialysis are at a risk for fluid overload, which can lead to pulmonary edema. If the SpO2 is low and they're working to breathe, I place them immediately on a non rebreather so they get 100% FiO2 immediately. This would then give us time to figure out what else is going on and then transition him into high-flow nasal cannula, just a regular nasal cannula, or even non-invasive such as BiPAP. How is the blood pressure and how is the five lead rhythm on the cardiac monitor? 
the fluid overload can also lead to severe hypertension. And the rhythm is important to see because we know that the electrolytes may be out of whack, especially the potassium. Is there an obvious abnormality? Of course, we were prepared to get an ECG soon to look at the finer details. If the patient is hypertensive, know that we just don't immediately jump to medications as dialysis patients often live on the higher side with their blood pressure. And if this patient typically doesn't take his blood pressure meds like discussed in the scenario, his body may be used to higher levels. Now, on the other hand, if the, P is, if the blood pressure is 260 over 140 and is showing signs of end organ damage, such as altered mental status and so forth, we may give a medication to help lower it just a bit. But we are definitely definitely not going to drop him any more than the 20% of the map since you could end up hypoperfusing organs that are used to higher pressures. If the patient is altered, of course, getting a point of care glucose to rule out hypoglycemia, performing a neuro assessment to ensure there are no stroke-like symptoms. We know that uremia can cause altered mental status. The providers may also order a head CT for that. So we got him on the monitor, we went down the ABCs, placed him on oxygen, checked the glucose, and most importantly, next we are going to place an IV. Dialysis patients are often hard to stick, so don't forget, two tourniquets, let gravity help, give some good love taps so the veins pop out, and remember the sites, the back of the hand, the wrist side, with the thumb, the medic vein, the AC, or anywhere you can even find a vein, even the shoulder of course stay away from the arm that has the fistula if they have one what do you anticipate for the workup you're expecting the essentials like a chemistry and a cbc the chemistry will let you see the electrolyte and organ function the cbc will let you look at the hemoglobin and white count a vbg will let you see the potassium level fast plus a lactate a rough co2 base excess and so forth the ecg will ensure there is no cardiac irritability in place or even any ischemia in the heart and the chest x-ray will let us evaluate for pulmonary edema. Now, what are the treatments for hyperkalemia, fluid overload, especially when dialysis is lagging? The treatments, if potassium comes back high, includes again, calcium gluconate, insulin and dextrose, sodium bicarbonate, kyxalate, and dialysis. And if fluid overload, dialysis is going to be necessary to eventually get that fluid out. If they're in acute respiratory distress, non-invasive will help them will help them and it will get started for this patient. And by the way, if you're finding this helpful and want to save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER, check out our book and course. They're packed with everything you need, including foundational material, practice tests, and tips to help you become a more confident and competent ER nurse. Links are below in the description and pinned comment. Now, let's wrap it up with some nursing-specific priorities for managing hyperkalemia. As with any cardiac-related concern, your first move is to get, with, get an ECG because changes can show up before a lab result. Look for those peak T waves or widening QRS complexes. Right after this, make sure that you send labs off. If you want a quick idea of the potassium level, send a VBG. It gives you a ballpark of the level super fast. But for accuracy, always send a chemistry as well. Your patient must be on the cardiac monitor, no exceptions. These patients can go into a ventricular arrhythmia suddenly and you want to be ready. I've said, that, I've said it before, but it's always worth repeating. Give the calcium first. It won't lower potassium, but it will stabilize the heart and give you time to set up the rest of your treatment. The one thing that I do want to mention is that if your patient goes into a ventricular arrhythmia, for example, ventricular fibrillation and your patient has no pulse and they're in a cardiac arrest, you're not giving calcium gluconate anymore. You're giving calcium chloride at that point. So just be aware of that. Also, never give insulin without checking the blood sugar first. You don't want to cause hypoglycemia. Use regular insulin IV only for these patients in, with hyperkalemia. And now here's a practical tip. We know patients often have terrible veins. If your facility allows it, learn how to place an EJIV. Many dialysis patients still have a good external jugular, which can be a lifesaver in emergencies. But again, that does come with its own protocols and it has to be something that your facility allows you to do and gives you the proper treatment. Finally, even if the patient is going to have dialysis, don't assume that means you do nothing. You may still need to give calcium, insulin, bicarb. Your job is to stabilize them while dialysis is being arranged.
And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.